to invite uh, if, if we're going to be having a banquet or a party. And we're going to take a close look at that advice in a minute, but, but before we do that, I want to say something about the teachings in gen of Jesus in general. And, and some of you have heard me say things like this before, but I want to reiterate this uh, yet again. Some years ago, I had a, a, a teacher who would always, always tell us students that when we read the words of Jesus, we should always look for what he called the reversal. And by that, I think he meant that, that Jesus almost always, in the way that he teaches and the way that he lives, he goes against what you would expect him to do. Or he says things that go against our usual expectations, right? So, for example, he says, the first shall be last. Where in the world does that happen? I mean, you know, not, not in the world that most of us live in. The first are coming first. If you're last, you're last. But he says, no, in reality, in a deeper reality, in the level that you ne can't necessarily see, but if you look with the eyes of faith, you will find that the first shall be last. And the least will be the greatest. And if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you would learn to be the servant of all. He said no, right? those that's, that's the reversal. He says where, where Jesus says things that are the reverse or the opposite of what we tend to think and the way we can tend to live, right? And, and, and when we think of it, if, if that's happening, and of course, again, this is one of those times in our gospel lesson where he's, there's a reversal. He says, don't invite the th people you think you would invite. No, we just naturally invite. And invite all the folks you might say, man, I would want to invite these folks. Invite those people. And so another example of a reversal. And, and so one of the things I think, there's a, there's a principle here in, in, in that if you, if you accept Jesus' teachings, not just the individual teachings, but this whole reversal, what he's saying is that this world is the thing that's upside down, not, uh, not my teachings. <laughs> and if we are going to take Jesus seriously, we have to expect and understand that this world is the world that's upside down and not Jesus' teachings. You understand what I'm saying? How many of you know that this world is upside down? How many of you know that, that if... That, 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 if that, that heaven is almost the, the exact opposite <laughs> of where we are living and how we're living now. Amen? Amen? And that's what Jesus, I think, is trying to get at with all of these reversals, all of these uh, things that he says that, you know, say, oh, wow, wow, I never thought of it that way. And either we think, oh, well, he's crazy because things that's the way they are are just fine, or we say, yeah, he's right, the world is upside down and he's trying to set it up right. So let's think of that as we think about these, uh, these teachings that Jesus gives about uh, invitations. Okay? So, imagine that you're having a party at your house or at a some place, you know, for some event. I mean, the cool thing about the parties we have here at the church is we don't have an invitation. If anybody who wants to Right? But when you're at your house, you've got limited space or that sort of thing. So you're going to have a party, and who do you invite? I don't know about you, but when I start thinking about a party at my house, I think of a couple of different things. I say, well, you know, who are some people that uh, I enjoy being with? You know, folks who will help make this party be successful. And then I might think also, oh, well, gosh, you know, who... Who invited us uh, to their house and, and we haven't yet returned the invitation? And we need to even that out. And then I might be thinking of folks, well, you know, I, they're not really friends of ours yet, but I'd like to have them here so that we could have a chance. And I think my other friends would enjoy these folks, but then maybe out of this, I'll get, you know, another friend. Right? Those are the kinds of things that I tend to think about. I suspect you do as well. Uh, other, I know that some people also, 
when they think about who they're going to invite to a party, they think about folks like, they think about it like, okay, you know, how is my party going to get on the map? How is this going to become known as the social event of the year? Who are the movers and the shakers and the important people that I need to invite? I'm not saying I think that way, but some people do. Some people, when they invite folks to their house, they, they say, oh, well, you know, this person knows so-and-so, and maybe because I'll be able to get to know this person, I'll get to know so-and-so, or, or this person, uh, you know, they know powerful people who might be able to help me out in some way or another, or, or I might even be able to do business with some of these folks. You know, all the folks that we like to think that we're going to invite, they have all something in common whether it's just the folks we enjoy being with or folks that in a more calculated way we think they might be able to help us. They have all of them something in common. They, there's a benefit to us when they come, right? Even like I say, just oh, we enjoy their being there or, or, or maybe something, like I said, a little bit more calculated or shrewd. Well, Jesus has a topsy-turvy idea about who we should invite. And so let's hear his advice again uh, from the Gospel of Luke. He says first, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives, or your rich neighbors, in case they might invite you in return, and, and you will be repaid. You'll get something out of these folks in some way or other. You know? and, and many, many of our relationships are like that, aren't they? They're, they're kind of, you know, in a way, we kind of use people, and they use us. And he's saying, if, 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 it's, if you're going to use somebody to have a better time, or whatever, increase your prestige, or whatever, don't. Throw that list away. All the people that you would be the first ones to come to our mind when we are putting our guest list together, throw that list away. Every one of the people on that list has the potential to benefit or repay us in some way or another, and that's not why we should be in relationship with folks, right? Then, he does tell us who we should put on our guest list. He says, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. In other words, Jesus says, invite the people who don't get invitations very much. Invite the people who folks exclude. Invite the folks where you say, you know, let's have this person over at our house. And, the, and everybody says, well, why would we ever do that? Those are the kinds of folks that Jesus is saying, we should invite to the table. Include the excluded. Invite the uninvited. Roll out the welcome mat for the rejected. Lavish hospitality upon those the world in general ignores or looks down on or discards. And the reason for this is because they can't pay you back. You, you, there's, there's no capacity that you could see, at least, for reciprocity in this relationship. It's, there's no hidden motive for why you might want to be in a relationship with them. They cannot pay you back, says Jesus, and in, in Jesus' upside-down view of things, that's a good thing. Now, the image of, of people sitting together around a table uh, is, is a powerful one. You know, we all need to eat for one thing. So everybody sits at one kind of table or another. Amen? Yeah. Some of us eat regularly at long tables with all sorts of folks around us with plenty of food, plenty of options. Others of us sit by ourselves at a small table with hardly a crust of bread to eat. But we sit at some kind of table. Amen? And the question is, who is invited to your table? And who's invited to God's table? We're going to 
talk about. But it's a powerful image, this sitting around a table. It, it speaks of how this universal need to eat is also related to our universal need to belong. We all need to belong to something, amen? Like I said, some sit at long tables with all sorts of people. Others sit by themselves at small, simple tables. Now, these last ones are the uninvited, the ones that Jesus says we should make sure we include and seat in the places of honor. Like I said before, it won't surprise you to say that Jesus is talking about far more than dinner parties, right? The powerful image of the dinner table is really about community, isn't it? Isn't it about the part of human family and whether we feel part of that or not? Who's in community with whom? And who gets invited? Who's left out? Who is seen as really belonging? And who gets at best tolerated? Who are considered to be the less than desirable? Who get, who get enthusiastically embraced? And who are discarded? For Jesus, the important thing is for everyone to get an invitation to the banquet table that is the family of God. And, and, and since there are some who will automatically get an invite, the rich, the good-looking, the well-connected, the talented, the able, Jesus doesn't seem to be too worried about that. He is, however, very concerned about the poor, the physically disabled, the blind, the folks who in Jesus' time and place were seen as somehow less than somehow not fully human, somehow people who didn't have much to offer to us. People who we think to be in relationship with them means that we have to give a whole lot more than we might ever be able to get with from them. Amen? Amen? You know, we still have our folks in our culture that we see as the folks who don't merit in them, right? It might not be the blind or the lame or the uh, the the, uh, the, blind, the disabled or the poor, but even in our supposedly more enlightened times, there are folks who are forced to the margins, who are neglected, who are who are warehoused in institutional settings, who are living a, an isolated and ghostly existence. And, and, and in today's parlance, one of the ways we might say this is, is poor lives matter, or disabled lives matter, or, or the lives of left out people matter. And, and, and this is not to say that other lives don't matter, but we already know those other lives have ma have matter. <laughs> and now we need to make sure that every life matters, and sometimes that means we call out specifically Black lives matter, or poor lives matter, or whatever it might be. But when we understand that the human community, uh, if, it, if we believe that it includes all human uh, beings, and if we believe especially that the Church of Jesus Christ ought to be at least in theory able to welcome all people, there's a problem when we realize that whether it's in the church or in society in general, there are still too many people who remain uninvited into full membership of the human family and full membership in the family of God. People who experience the sting of feeling less than, who even when they do get invited, find that they are not fully included. You know, I suspect that there might be folks here this morning who have experienced that sense of being among the uninvited. You know, and, 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 and while I've had all sorts of privileges and, and gifts and blessings in my life, I, I, even, I can say, I know in my own life, there have been times when I felt, oh, I don't fit in. And so we, all of us, many, or many of us at least, will have, can have some kind of a sense of what it's like to be among the uninvited. But nothing like the daily 
experience that so many folks have, whether they're mentally ill or physically disabled or developmentally disabled, they feel this sort of diminishment every single day. But perhaps even though we don't, some of us have that experience, we can try for a moment to understand this constant everyday feeling that of people who are, for example, dis de developmentally disabled, just to use one example, feel every day. By, by developmentally disabled, we, as folks that when I grew up, we used to say they were mentally retarded. But now we use this language of developmentally disabled. To, and, 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 and I'll just bring that up because I, I, I was thinking in my own life, you know, who have been the, some of the people that I have known that I've learned a little bit about what this feeling of un, being uninvited looks like or feels like. And, and, and I came to, uh, it, it came to my mind a, a woman that I knew many, many years ago named Flo. She was a member of my first church at and she was herself developmentally disabled. She lived in a group home that was a couple blocks down from the church. And, and she and two others of the people who lived in this group home, uh, uh, Ginger and Jean and Flo, the three of them would walk down to church every Sunday. Now I gotta tell you, I, I have to make a confession here, brothers and sisters. Do you, do you, do you does it, uh, surprise you and or disturb you that sometimes even us pastors sometimes think that some folks are a little annoying? Does that surprise you? Does that shock you? <laughs> I, I don't feel good about it, but there are times that I have said, oh man, yeah. And Flo was one of those folks. Flo uh, she was the most verbal of all th of the three. She was always in charge. And, and Flo, she was very kind of, uh, she was kind of conniving. And one of the things she loved to do is she would love to get on the phone. There was one community phone in this, uh, this group home that she lived in. And she could come up with any excuse that she could think of so that she would be able to use the phone. And I was one of those excuses. I get phone calls from Flo all the time about just about anything. If she didn't really necessarily need to talk to me, she just needed me to be her excuse to use the phone. So Saturday night was not unusual at all. You know, Saturday night is a uh, night of you know for our family to kind of relax a little bit and and uh, you know spend some time with the family, or if not, work on my sermon <laughs> and. Uh, and so it wasn't necessarily my favorite time to be interrupted. And, and Flo would call out and she would say, Pastor, uh, uh, can I wear long pants to church tomorrow? For some... <laughs> Flo, just make sure you are wearing clothes. <laughs> and you will be, you will, you'll be fine. <laughs> and, then, and then I'd be... In that church, we would walk down the aisle, the, the clergy and the lead readers, we would walk down the aisle while the first hymn was coming. So we would process. And, and, and nine times out of ten, Flo would want to talk to me while, she, while I'm coming in. Pastor! Pastor! Or, 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 or you know, we, and we would take uh, prayer requests, not on cards, but spoken. And, and she always had three or four. And, and, you know, and, and, I, and now and then I flow, you know, flow. Well, that all changed uh, a, a couple of months into my time there uh, when I went to visit her at the group home. And she showed me up to her room, and, uh, and the first thing I noticed that in this room, there were all these pictures from your church. There was pictures of every pastor who had ever served that church while she was there. There were pictures of or, or articles about the church. And I realized this was her family. This was her life. You know, we know that saying that, you know, you know, we, we, we can't all make an impact on the world as a whole, but you know, sometimes you can be the whole world for one person. 
And that's the way it was with the flow. And I said to myself, Lord, have mercy on me. I confess, Lord, and I can repent now of finding this person annoying and, and let me see her the same way she sees me. Amen? Amen. Well, that was one of them. And then I got to thinking also of another one. And this is a, a little different situation, but a friend of mine named Randy, who I met many years ago. He's no longer living, but uh, we were in seminary together. And uh, Randy, he had a condition called muscular dystrophy, which is a, a terrible, uh, terrible, I believe it's genetic uh, condition that your muscles waste away and it eventually kills you and there's no, no cure for it. Well, he was in his late 20s by this point and he had, I guess you might say, a fairly mild case of it because he was not yet in a wheelchair. A lot of folks are dead by his time with that. But he kind of walked very slowly and very with little, and he had no strength, just enough strength to keep himself upright, but couldn't walk, climb upstairs on his own, couldn't walk very far distances, that sort of thing. Well, I met him maybe two or three weeks into the semester when he arrived, and he told me his story. Well, the reason I met him was because he was waiting. We lived in the same dorm, and he was waiting at the door of the dormitory for somebody to come by and help him get up the stairs. Because, he, like I said, he couldn't walk up the stairs on his own. So he says to me, you know, uh, hello, we'd never met before. He said, would you be willing to help me get up the stairs? And I said, sure. Said, Show me what I need to do. And he, he asked me to get right under his arm with, with all of my strength on this side and then basically just lift him up to the next step, and then lift him up to the next step, and I, I said, boy, there's no elevator, isn't it? is there? I'd never even thought about it. He says, no. And then he started telling me the story. He, he was from a state called Arkansas, which is about 1,500 miles west of here. And he applied to this East Coast seminary to, to study, to be administrator. And, uh, and, you know, I can, I can relate to this because I grew up in the Midwest. People think of the, of the East as this place of enlightenment. And he, he explained very carefully you know, on his application his physical needs. But he said, you know, this is in Boston. Surely they're so far ahead of us in terms of being able to accommodate folks like me. So they'll notice, and if there's any problem, they'll let me know. Well, they didn't. And after driving three straight days all by himself with what little belongings he had and a little trailer behind him, he arrived at the dormitory where he was supposed to be living to find <coughs> he couldn't even get in. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Now, I'll tell you, while Randy was physically disabled, he was a mighty spiritual warrior. And he had that going for him that a lot of folk don't. And I will never forget when three years later he graduated and when they handed him his diploma from this institution. And how joyful he and any of us who knew his story was. But, but in those three years, he not only was able to keep up with his studies, but he literally, with help from the Holy Spirit, broke the will and forced the hand of Harvard University so that he could say, you know, you all, you admitted me, you, you supposedly invited me, but I wasn't really Included. Now, now you all need to include who you invited. And today, the Harvard Divinity School campus is fully handicap accessible, largely through the efforts of my friend Randy. Now that's inspiring, but you know what? Nobody should have to go through that. No, it, it shouldn't be so hard. For simple things, expensive things, but still 
simple things to be done to make sure that we really mean what we say when we say you are included. Well, so those are maybe, you know, maybe you can think of folks in your life who can help you understand the day-to-day -day struggles that maybe some of us have here, but probably most of us don't. And think about what it means to make sure that we invite not just invite, but prepare for everybody to be at the table. You know, the interesting thing is this. We're going to have communion in a little while. That's just a, you know, that's God's table. That's the, that's something that's a precursor of the heavenly banquet that, that we're all going to enjoy someday. And, and you know what? At the heavenly banquet, everybody, every kindred, every nation, every tongue will be there. Every ability, they'll all be healed. Just like we will. But we're supposed to create these little <coughs> foretastes of that. And one of the things that we may want to learn as we accept Christ's invitation to the table is maybe rethinking where we stand. So how many of you know that at times you can be crippled? You can be blind. You can be lame. How many know that when we come to the table, we really can't add too much to God's life? You know, God doesn't need us to come to the table to entertain Him. God doesn't need us because He needs some connections to get His work done. God doesn't need much of anything from us. Okay? God doesn't need much of anything from us, and yet, blind as we can sometimes be, Poor, whether poor in spirit or in pocket, lame, blind, we get invited. No questions asked. I don't know really what that means. Does anyone know what that means? Hopefully, we're not on fire. <laughs> anyway. Uh, just remember, while we're thinking, you know, well, pastor says that Jesus wants us to invite, you know, the blind and the lame and all of this. Just remember who Jesus is invites to his table. And remember that one day we were all blind, one day we were all lame, one day we were all poor. We still got an invitation. Just for us. When we come to the table, that's the way it works. And who are we to prevent anyone else from coming? Amen. Amen. Amen.